Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Remaking the Economy in New Mexico. I'm Steve Dubb and I'm senior editor here at uh, Nonprofit Quarterly. Uh, today we're launching our second season of Remaking the Economy. Uh, this season, MPQ's Economic Justice uh, series goes on the virtual road at least and uh, each month we'll be lifting up community work in specific places, um, starting today with New Mexico. Please feel encouraged uh, to offer your suggestions. Uh, we'll have a five question survey after the webinar. Uh, I do wanna introduce our guest. Um, so on the webinar live, we have um, Anzia Bennett, uh, Executive Director of Three Sisters Kitchen in Albuquerque. Uh, we have Sandra McCardle. Uh, she's Coordinating Director of Community Catalyst of New Mexico, and we have uh, Keith Adaki, a president of the Arts Cooperative, which stands for Ancestral Rich uh, Treasures of Zuni. Um, so uh, we'll also be showing a video interview in which I uh, talk with Alvin Warren. He's a program officer for New Mexico programs at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Um, a few notes before we get started. Uh, first, uh, we're very excited to take all your questions. Um, and we'll be leaving a good amount of time at the end of the webinar, at least 20 to 30 minutes, um, you know, for a panelist to answer your questions. So please uh, enter questions as you have them during the presentations and uh, I will get to them and share them with panelists when we get to that part of the discussion. Um, second, uh, this is always a perennial question about what happens to the slides and the recordings and let me uh, reassure you, that you will in fact receive links to the slides and uh, recording after the webinar. So you don't need to post in the chat box asking that question. And finally, uh, we are happy to offer this webinar uh, free of charge to all of our community. But uh, as I'm sure you understand, uh, it's not free to produce these things. So if you can, uh, please consider uh, supporting MPQ today. Uh, Earlier this month, uh, we were fortunate uh, to be awarded a $7,500 uh, matching grant from the J.R. O'Shea Foundation in Buffalo to support uh, our economic justice work. Um, so that means that basically every dollar you donate uh, actually gives us $2. So hopefully that's some incentive and, and please uh, pitch in. Uh, you can also support our work um, in other ways by joining the conversation via social media. Uh, we have our hashtag, uh, hashtag rebuild the economy. So feel free to share comments and questions and we'd love to hear them. So again, thanks for being here today um, and uh, do look for that uh, survey after the webinar. And uh, now I will uh, share a few uh, slides just to frame the today's discussion. All right, um, thank you. And um, uh, so I just wanna talk a little bit about our economic justice uh, program. Um, and um, you know some of the things that we are aiming to do at Nonprofit Quarterly. Um, and this starts with, you know, so the, the big goals are really to uh, build uh, understanding about uh, the systemic nature of the economy and the need for systemic change, as well as knowledge of community economic development. Part of that's identifying our core principles. Uh, we wanna lift up case studies. That's why we're looking at communities. Uh, we're committed to using a racial equity lens we want to get beyond beneath the economic iceberg, meaning uh, that a lot of what we um, what we experience from the economy isn't uh, immediately visible. Um, we're also looking to curate and develop educational materials and shift practice in the field. So, uh, the webinar series is one element of a of a broader initiative of Nonprofit Quarterly, uh, really to be in conversation uh, regarding with the sector regarding economic justice. Um, next slide. So uh, why is a just economy necessary? I thought I'd just cite an article that we published uh, earlier this year. This was by Jennifer Hinton. And you know she wrote about the challenges of inequality and ecological degradation. Um, and you know, so we need uh, for whether, whether your nonprofit is in uh, doing community development or human services of the arts, uh, you know, religion, hospitals, education, so forth. Lots of different areas where, where our nonprofits are based, uh, but, you know, fundamentally we need to be able to develop widespread uh, human well-being within the ecological limits of the planet. Um, and the economy as it's structured right now is not doing that. So we need an economy 
that serves people and planet, not the other way around. Uh, I just want to give a little bit of background on, on New Mexico. I certainly could do a lot more, and, and you'll hear some from Alvin in a couple minutes. Uh, but one factor I think is important to point out, uh, not unlike a lot of states in the United States, is, is in increasing income inequality. Uh, New Mexico is among the highest. I believe it ranks around 10th. Um, so the that's a ratio there at the bottom of the, the wealthiest 5% of households compared to the poorest 20% of households, almost 15 times the annual income. Um, so that's an incredible uh, number. And if you look at the trend lines, you can see what's been happening. So the top 1% have seen their incomes rise by 55%. Um, the other 99% have seen their income fall by 9%. That's over a period of four years or close to four years. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, here we're going to be featuring a, a few case studies of, of how the start to, at least at a micro level, begin, both a micro and a statewide level, uh, begin to address these inequalities. So Three, Three Sisters Kitchen is a, a business incubator uh, working uh, in communities of color in Albuquerque. Uh, Co-op Catalyst is working statewide on, on policy as well as providing development support for startup co-ops. And Arts Co-op is on Zuni Pueblo land in uh, Northwest New Mexico. And, and it's really you know, working to change the structure of the native artisan market. Uh, so those are just a few examples. Earlier uh, this month, we published a, a story on New Mexico looking at uh, La Esquinita and Borelis neighborhood <laughs> in Albuquerque. So there really is a lot of activity um, to, to lift up. Uh, next slide. And so, um, just want to point out, this is this is where we're going to be going. Um, uh, next stop will be Indian Country, which of course is a broad community uh, involving 573 uh, tribal nations. Uh, we'll then move after the winter break uh, to Los Angeles. Uh, we'll then go down to the U.S. South, uh, up to uh, you know, the industrial area of uh, a city, you know, rebuilding from there uh, in Buffalo, New York. Um, back to California and Central Valley, and we'll end up in Chicago. So that's where we're going, If uh, particularly for those last five places. We're interested in your suggestions of people and groups of the feature, and, and of course, beyond. So uh, we're always looking for articles, stories that we can um, you know, make visible at a nonprofit quarterly. Um, so with that, I'm going to move and let you see the interview that I did with Alvin Warren. Welcome, and here we are with Alvin Warren, uh, Program Officer for uh, New Mexico Programs at the Kellogg Foundation. Alvin, welcome to uh, Nonprofit Quarterly. Uh, could you begin just by saying a little bit about your background and, and how you came to your current position? Sure. Thank you very much for the invitation, Steve, to be part of this webinar. Uh, so I, I come to the Kellogg Foundation from having worked primarily in tribal and state government, but also in the nonprofit sector. Um, and most of my career has been focused on Native American communities. My role here at the Kellogg Foundation, and I've been here for about six years as a program officer, is, is a statewide role working across all of our priority communities in, in four target counties and across the 23 tribes here. So I'm really excited here at the foundation. I, I focus most of my work on our economic security work or employment equity is another term we use for that. Could you talk a little bit about um, how you think of economic uh, systems change work? I'd be happy to. So our foundation about 2007 made a commitment to become an anti-racist organization focused on racial equity. We apply that very much to, to the work that we do. The way that we approach economic systems change is um, by making investments that um, support families in building their assets, in creating income generating opportunities and in accessing higher quality jobs. Great, thanks. Could you tell a story maybe about a, a challenge in the work and, and, and the way that a group in New Mexico has, has addressed that challenge in, in terms of approaching both uh, racial and economic equity? Right, so you know, in many cases um, in communities here in New Mexico, particularly indigenous communities, rural communities, Economic, economic systems are not really well designed for the way, for the reality, the day-to-day -day reality of families. 
So one of the things that we found over time is there's a real value in looking at how do we help communities and families to establish alternative economic approaches. And one of those that we've really become excited about are worker-owned cooperatives. Um, this is something that is, of course, cooperatives is well known across the world, certainly something that's happening in many parts of the United States, and something that's, that's really taking hold here in New Mexico. So uh, knowing that um, individuals often face these barriers, particularly the folks that I mentioned, indigenous, immigrant, women, people of color, especially lower income families, we began to fund an effort here, a, a collaborative effort to create um, a catalyst, a New Mexico co-op catalyst to help support individuals, groups of individuals and really families to establish cooperatively owned businesses um, to get at this barrier that prevents individuals from starting a business themselves. Great. Um, could you talk a little bit about maybe the impact, you know, whether it's worker cooperatives or other forms of, of, of uh, small business incubation that you guys are supporting in, in communities of color. How does this actually, you know, what, what is the impact of this on, on actual uh, working families? I can think of one of the investments that we have here in New Mexico, which is directly with um, a, a cooperative of direct caregivers. And immediately we know based on the data that if those individuals were to go and work for, you know, the, the average um, company, their wages would be much less, significantly less, than the wages of individuals who are becoming worker owners of this particular cooperative. So right away, the data is very clear. The second thing that we know is, by and large, in, in, that, particular, uh, in that particular sector, it's predominantly women and women of color who are, who are serving as direct caregivers, very often um, who have young children. So, the alternative, in other words, being an employee in a company that, again, across, you know, on, on average, certainly there's some businesses that, that I'm sure provide better pay and benefits, but on average uh, does not pay much, anything close to a living wage. In fact, that doesn't even, uh, can certainly not meet that family's needs. Um, to moving to become a worker owner of this direct caregivers cooperative, and seeing not only increased wages and increased benefits, but also over time, the ability to develop an, uh, an ownership stake in the company and build that as an asset, as a, as a long-term asset, a wealth building strategy for the family. Great, um, thanks. Um, you know, one thing that strikes me about New Mexico has been the success, uh, I mean, it's still early days, but, it, but the success you're seeing uh, with worker co-op developments in in native communities in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, you know, why do you think we're, you're seeing that success? What, what's what's behind that? Um, so that's a great question, Steve. So it's important to know when we first funded the the New Mexico um, co-op catalyst, um, their intent was to focus on uh, the creation of worker-owned cooperatives by lower income individuals, particularly individuals of color uh, and those that have young children. They didn't specifically set out to support cooperatives in native communities. What I find really interesting is over the natural course of the first phase, which was kind of the pilot phase of the work, um, the place where they found the most momentum were in two native communities. In the Navajo Nation, which is a very large tribal nation here in New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah, and in the Pueblo of Zuni. You know, I would tell you a story from my community where during farming season, you know, yes, individuals might have their own plots of land that they farmed, but it was common for individuals to help each other out, particularly at harvest time where you have a short window to, to take things from the field, perhaps before there's a freeze. Each individual alone or even each individual family might not be able to respond quickly enough and you'd have other individuals, neighbors, family, extended relatives who would go and help. So to make it sort of concrete, there's, there's two particular cooperatives that came out of that pilot phase. The first is called the Diné Regenerative Agricultural Cooperative. And this is a group of about eight to 10 sheep growers Navajo sheep growers um, who have individual sheep uh, uh, sheep herds, but in order to scale their business, 
have made the decision that to scale as an individual grower is, is too difficult, um, too challenging. But by pooling their resources, sharing costs to increase production, and then scale, it's a much more viable system for them. In Zuni, I'll just say briefly, the decision there was really about 20 individuals or so who are all artisans. And Zuni's very, very well known for, for you know, meticulously made beautiful jewelry in particular. And a group of artisans decided to form a cooperative as a way that really helped them to, to protect their intellectual property, um, to expand their market opportunities, um, to develop a, a collective physical hub so they have a gallery space that they've collectively leased rather than having one individual have to bear that burden entirely. So there's a collective approach to leasing that, um, that place. And really, I think what's important to, that we heard, and another reason why perhaps this has taken hold so quickly in Native communities, particularly these Native communities, is the coordinators there who, who helped both of these efforts said that they saw co-ops as a way to link elders with youth and children, and that the cooperative approach allowed for or even strengthened a multi-generational approach, uh, including cultural and family bonds that ultimately, yes, would help with the success of the business venture, but one that reinforces community, that reinforces um, culture, um, and at the same time provides a greater opportunity for families to earn, you know, fairer living wages and, you know, be able to compete um, in, in a highly competitive market. Great, thanks. Are there lessons from some of these efforts that are taking place in, in New Mexico uh, that you think can be, speak to a larger national audience? I would say some of the lessons in New Mexico, which are also indicative of the, the, what the Kellogg Foundation has learned over you know, many decades, um, is the interplay of three particular dynamics or, or components just leadership, racial equity, and community engagement. I've spoken a bit about racial equity and, and really I think fundamentally recognizing that there, there are embedded, deeply embedded structural inequities that prevent um, a lower income individual of color from, from having the same opportunity to be successful as someone else. Leadership is another thing we've really learned. And if, and if you heard the two stories that I was describing, um, leadership is deeply embedded in that, whether it's the role of the coordinators, but even the individual folks who are coming together repeatedly to say, we're willing to learn how to apply this model and to take on a, 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 you know, a collective additional risk. Um, it requires developing leadership and not so much leadership in a formal sense, but really the skills of leadership that help individuals to come together to jointly problem solve, um, to take risk, to learn together. Uh, and that's a crucial part. And then finally, community engagement. And, and I think this is the fundamental lesson is to listen to community. It is very important for us to keep going back out to community and to individuals and say, is this working for you? And when we hear that, that even despite our best efforts, that systems as currently designed and funded are not best serving their needs, we need to listen to, um, to their ideas for what alternative approaches they wanna pursue. And, and be willing, and this is particular, I think, for philanthropy, be willing to take the risk of funding those knowing that they are experimental, that sometimes they need to be tested and refined. Um, but very often community knows what works and what doesn't work. Great, um, thank you, uh, Alvin, for Alvin Warren from the uh, Program Officer at the Kellogg Foundation and uh, we'll return to the webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for, for having me here today and for featuring the work of Three Sisters Kitchen. Three Sisters is a nonprofit community group based in the heart of downtown Albuquerque. Our mission is to use the power and love of local food to create economic opportunity, improve community health, and bring our diverse communities together around the table. And I so appreciate what Alvin Warren just stated about you know communities know what they need. Um, and we spent a, a three years, two two to three years really just talking and listening to community, asking them what does a community need? 
um, and what does this space need to be relevant to our communities, to their lives, to their families, to their work? Um, and those conversations, those suggestions, those ideas, those action plans really helped us to build food for the kitchen. And so the kitchen itself is a beautiful space right in the heart of downtown Albuquerque that houses a community classroom, a community dining room, a commercial test kitchen, and a local food shop and cafe. Our programs, as, as representative of our mission, really focus on economic opportunity. We run a food business training program. It's a 15-week training program that is designed for the needs of low-income, aspiring, manufactured foods entrepreneurs. And we really focus on um, what it means to build and operate a values-driven food business. That program is 15 weeks long, but is just the beginning of building a big, vibrant, um, beautiful community of, of food entrepreneurs here in Albuquerque and beyond. We also operate an indoor farmer's market so that growers and other food producers can connect directly to local consumers. Um, and we house and, and are really excited to have just opened a local food shop and cafe, similarly featuring local produce on our menu, local ingredients um, on our shelves, and helping people to celebrate the bounty of New Mexico and, and put their money where their, their values are and, and buy local, support local. Our community health programs um, are really diverse and really similarly responsive to what community members were asking for. We operate a, a series of healthy cooking classes in our community classroom, celebrating the food traditions of, of people living in New Mexico and helping each other feel more confident cooking with local ingredients and, and cooking healthy food. We also operate in partnership with a number of other really wonderful community-based organizations, a home health aid training program. So for those, those um, home health care providers that Alvin Worm was referring to, who are looking to increase confidence and capacity in utilizing local ingredients and preparing healthy food for the clients in their care, we have a wonderful 10-week program called harvest to health. And we also operate a fruit and vegetable voucher program that helps food insecure households in the downtown neighborhood access fresh, healthy, locally grown food. And then community building is really at the heart of what we do. So we are not a, a co-op. The structure of Three Sisters Kitchen is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, but the values of mutual benefit and cooperative ethics are really at the core of our work. And so we make our space available to community partners, individuals, community organizations, and we really think about how we can learn and build together. Um, for those of you that live in or have been to Albuquerque, downtown is, is the urban center of the city, and we focus on serving community within a three mile radius of downtown. However, we have participants and members and customers coming in from all over the state and all over the city. Um, Albuquerque, like the rest of New Mexico, has a high diversity index, and the majority of folks in our surrounding neighborhood identify as Hispanic or Latinx. Downtown attracts um, workers, and, and our population during the day is close to 110,000, as opposed to, to people living downtown, which is closer to 80,000. Per capita income is low. Um, average of 22,370, um, and we have really high poverty rates and really high food insecurity rates. Um, we also know that there's tremendous energy, creativity, and so many assets in our neighborhoods, and so we really focus on what people are looking for, what they need, and, and what they want to be building and, and sharing as well. Another key component of our community at Three Sisters is our, our local producers, our farmers, ranchers, and food businesses who are looking for stable markets to help build their businesses and who are excited to connect directly with consumers. And, and we really strive to create as many outlets for those folks to, to make money and, and earn what they deserve to live healthy and happy lives as well. Next slide, please. 
Um, so there are a few components of the programs at Three Sisters that I'm excited to focus on today. Um, as I said, our food business training program really centers on what does it mean to build a, a values-driven food business. And we follow the, the model of the Restaurant Opportunity Center and others, um, their call for utilizing and implementing high road industry practices in the restaurant sector and in the food sector. And really what high road practices mean are treating people like people. Um, so paying a living wage, covering benefits, providing real benefits and opportunities to, to invest in people and, and develop professionally, whether that's within or beyond our organization. Um, our program is really designed to meet the challenges we were hearing from aspiring food businesses and entrepreneurs, that they needed space to experiment and explore, that they needed access to capital, that they needed community to think and learn together, and that they needed connection to local farmers and ranchers so they could live their values by sourcing locally. Thank you, next slide. Our, our program is pretty pretty um, extensive, and I'm happy to talk about it more in the Q&A, but it's a 15-week training program focused on manufactured production techniques. We highlight high road practices, we highlight local sourcing, food safety, and really what it takes to become a successful food business. The idea is, um, you know, people without much financial capital don't often get the opportunity to experiment and explore and our program is designed to give that space so people can try things out see what's viable see if they love it see if it works for them before they're taking any financial risk of their own we provide extensive technical assistance and support upon program graduation and i want to let my fellow panelists um, share their models but look forward to continued conversation in the q a session thank you all so much Thank you, Anzia. And uh, now we'll hear from uh, Sandra McArdle. Uh, Sandra? So first I want to thank um, Steve and my co-presenters here for, um, for focusing on this part of the new economy. And I also want to thank Nonprofit Quarterly for starting the program with New Mexico. The land of enchantment. Um, my role is to talk a little bit about cooperatives, which, as have, has already been mentioned, are not in fact rare. There are about three million of them around the world, and they are of many types, as you can see in these logos here. They are formed by producers, workers, consumers, purchasers. They're in all sectors in all sizes and you are probably a member of at least one possibly more cooperatives what makes cooperatives different is that they are controlled and run by their members as businesses to benefit those members they often have common economic social and cultural needs and aspirations and they often share values of fairness, equality, social justice, and a need for long-term jobs and prosperity. Um, they allow members to succeed in spite of or break down barriers that prevent them from achieving their dream. The key is there is member economic participation, ownership, and control, and shared decision making. Um, so the one, um, the one thing to, to um, remember is that cooperatives should be attractive in many of the communities that lack resources in New Mexico. And we try to showcase the models, highlight the benefits of cooperatives, and help people to understand that effective cooperative structures grow, that you can see here these examples, highlight the ways in which ecosystems help cooperatives succeed. Based on some listening sessions that we started before we even formed, that there are a lot of people interested in cooperatives. They're government officials, and that's our round house in the picture. There are um, government agencies, elected officials, um, and a lot of people talking now about the great tsunami of people who have gray hair like me or silver 
um, who are looking to retire but don't have anybody to purchase their businesses. There are, importantly, the marginalized communities that Alvin Warren spoke about. And those can be immigrants, they can be farmers and ranchers, they can be Native American tribes, they can be almost anybody that you can think of that has some sort of a barrier to employment. Um, you know, one that people don't often think about is, um, is women with young children at home or families who are taking care of their elders. So all of those are potentially interested in cooperatives, but they can't do it themselves. And that's why the ecosystem is important. Next slide, please. The Cooperative Catalyst is a young organization. We've only been around about a couple of years and we're still learning and adapting. That part we hope will never change. Um, we listen to those we meet and we listen to those we work with. In fact, we started with a listening session um, that Steve Dubb participated in. Thank you, Steve, several years ago. And that's really, that's really one important thing that I want to highlight is, uh, as Alvin said, you need to listen. Our mission is to empower communities and individuals to create more economic opportunities by catalyzing and fostering local cooperatives. We really are a resource for those interested in forming, converting to, or growing cooperatives. And as uh, many of you probably know, there is a whole lot that goes into building a cooperative. The most important thing is probably the passion of the founding members. We're the catalysts and the coordinators who help co-op members achieve their dreams. And we hope to weave together more attention, resources, and knowledge so co-ops can strengthen New Mexico from within their families and communities, because that's where cooperatives start. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sandra, and uh, we'll now hear from uh, uh, Keith. So Keith, um, you're up. Hello, uh, thank you again, Steve. Uh, my name is Keith Adaki, and I'm from the Pueblo of Zuni. Uh, I am the president of our Zuni Arts Cooperative here. And just a little bit about Zuni and who we are. We are one of the biggest uh, Pueblos of the 20 that we have in New Mexico and Arizona. And in our community, our community is comprised of about 80% of our household people who are self-employed in one way or another, either if that's creating art or any other means of being self-employed. And uh, as stated earlier by Alvin, you know, our community is well known for its crafts and jewelry, but also pottery. Uh, a lot of the things that Zuni is also known for is the Zuni fetish carvings, uh, as well as some textiles and two-dimensional art that some of the artists here uh, do. Um, next slide. So before our market actually uh, opened here as a cooperative, uh, one of the things that we can kind of look back on as far as Zuni history is what we call the Zuni uh, jewelry boom that happened about in the 1970s. Uh, and that's when Zuni artisans were um, selling a lot of jewelry out uh, to different markets. Uh, what actually happened is there were some outsiders that came in and saw the potential of the Zuni economy as far as with the jewelry. And so what they did is they started by selling and trading jewelry, Zuni jewelry with potteries and blankets uh, from out of state. And then eventually they started purchasing this jewelry and reselling it uh, to a larger uh, market. And from there, you know, after the boom was over, you know, that was kind of the state that we were put in. Either you sell at a wholesale rate or a job rate, which is uh, dictated by an uh, individual who will resell the art. So a lot of times what happens is, you know, there was the scarcity of resources. Uh, being that a lot of people depended on their work 
to take care of their families. When somebody's dictating how much they can get for the work that they put in, it was really difficult to make ends meet um, as far as um, what they're creating. Uh, and then also another problem that we encountered was the mass production of imitation jewelry that we see. There's a big um, lawsuit that actually happened just within this past year of people importing uh, like Zuni jewelry uh, that was mass produced overseas and passed on as authentic Zuni art. Uh, one of the interesting things that we found out is there's actually a town uh, called Zuni in the Philippines uh, just so they can market the art as saying it was made in Zuni, which was the Zuni Philippines. And so one of those things that we were trying to do is, uh, you know, educate, you know, what's authentic and what's not. Uh, before our co-op, there's basically two tiers of artists that we have in our community. One of them is, which is a mass majority of the artists, is they're so used to selling to the jobber and wholesale rate. And so when they create something, they will visit one of the local galleries here and have the galleries dictate how much their art is worth versus having the artists ask for what they want for their pieces. And so one of the things that we see is a lot of the galleries here make more money than the artists themselves do. And so that kind of limits their resources to be able to take care of their families. Then we have another group of individuals who trying to change the market on their own. Uh, a lot of them sell more at a retail rate with going to different art shows. So a couple of the big art shows that a lot of our community members take part in is the Santa Fe India market, which is uh, in August. And then also another one in Phoenix called the Hurt Show uh, India market. And so those artists are, are able to take their arts and display them and sell directly to consumers. The only thing about that is that a lot of the expenses that they incur is done on an individual basis. So sometimes uh, if an artist is lucky, they're able to you know, make enough to cover their expenses, uh, but they also um, might not. And so those are some of the tiers that we're looking at. And then with the artists, uh, some of the things that um, that we notice is that some of the resources that we have here is so limited that, you know, instead of working together as a community, a lot of these artists are now competing against one another. Uh, instead of helping one another, they're trying to see if, if they find a resource, they tend to keep it to themselves versus then share with anybody else. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're doing here now is we're basically going back uh, to how we originally uh, were as a community. I think Alvin stated really well in his interview is that in our community, some of the things that we used to do is when somebody was struggling, when somebody was having a hard time, we will help one another. Um, but with our economy, with our financial status, when somebody's hovering over in us and only giving us so much of what we're asking for, you know, that created a lot of rift between the community and that kind of divided us. And now what we're trying to do is we're empowering our artists to work, to come back together. Uh, we're creating community enrichment by teaching our community artists of different ways to interact, different ways to conduct business and to really, you know, gauge their own market, you know, and to see what it is that their art is actually worth versus somebody telling them what it's worth. One of the things that we want to also do is educate consumers the authenticity of the work. You know, there are so many replicas, there's so many imitations out there that, you know, it's kind of difficult to identify what's authentic and what's mass produced overseas. And so those are some of the educations that we want to do here at our cooperative is to teach you know, what is authentic and what is fake. And we also want to tell these stories of why we create these arts. You know, originally they were used as household items. They were used to barter. But now with the, the way we use art, you know, we still want to tell these stories. Every single shape, every single stone that is grinded and uh, perfected to fit this inlaid piece, 
you know, it all tells a story and those are the stories that we want to tell um, that you won't hear at other galleries. You will hear it through a third person, but it means so much more when you hear it from a first person's um, viewpoint. Uh, next slide. So where we are right now is we are Zuni's only multi-artist owned and operated cooperative here in our community. Uh, there are some Zuni owned uh, businesses here, but for us to come together, it was a really uh, big feat that we accomplished because of the stigma around our community of working together especially when we're trying to create some kind of economy for ourselves, you know, it's always been me against other people. But now what we're trying to do is change that thinking is if we work together, it's so much easier to take on this economy. And so basically we're creating these network of artists. Each artist has the, their own way of understanding, their own way of doing business. And when we come together, it gives us so much more options of how to go about um, leading our cooperative and I think that's basically what it is we're listening to one another and making sure everybody's heard and nobody's excluded to move forward and basically we're creating a family a lot of times a lot of these artists are here um, and it just creates that camaraderie and creates um, the sense of family and you know as a family we're working through and we're trying to get through a lot of the obstacles that we're going through because we are still going through a learning process. Um, one of the big goals that we had is to actually open up a gallery here in our community and that's the building that you see at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so once that was open, uh, a lot of us uh, are artists first and a lot of the policies and procedures of running a gallery is very new to a lot of us. And so what we did is once we opened it, it was a big learning curve as far as, you know, what needs to be in place, what needs to be done. And I really commend my community. I really commend my artists here, you know, for sticking with it and really learning as we're going and being understandable. I think that's one of the things that's really helpful is that these artists understand how beneficial this co-op is to our, our community, how important it is for this to uh, continue, and how important it is to be a part of it. And so we are going through these learning processes, Bill, and um, you know we intend to be here for a very long time. And one of the ways that we are addressing those too is we are also starting an online gallery, and there's uh, some more learning processes that's going to have to happen through the online gallery too as well. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that we want to do from here is we want to involve more members. Like I said earlier, about 80% of our community are self-employed one way or another. And we have about clo getting close to 30 members in our cooperative. And that's less than 5% of our entire community here. So we do want to inform our community. One of the ways we are doing that is by educating, uh, just like how we were educated, what a cooperative is. Because at the beginning of the year, a lot of our artists didn't understand the concept of cooperatives. Even though we have been living it, it's just nobody put that kind of name to it. And so educating our members, our community, of what a cooperative is and how it basically goes back to a lot of the traditional values that we have in, had in still for a very long time is just that some of these factors has kind of um, taken away um, those abilities to live with those values. And so a lot of education, a lot of connecting back to our traditional values are some of the things that we're trying to do. One of the things that we also want to do is create a long-term marketing plan. Uh, we've opened in August and we've done fairly well with sales and that was all done without any marketing, but uh, we do really want to get a good marketing plan out there to get people come, to come to Zuni to, tell, to allow us to tell our stories, allow our uh, cons consumers, allow our visitors to get an experience that, you know, it's unforgettable because it's not really about just buying the art. It's about being part of those experiences of how those arts were created. And those are some of the things that we do want to emphasize. And that's something that makes us unique as a gallery that we can 
offer to our consumers is that more one-on-one -on -one, uh, experience as far as buying art, seeing how it's created and how it's produced. And we're also looking at different facets as far as our economic development. So art is one of them. But like I said, our artists are very, very well talented in a lot of different things that, you know, we have been looking at different options as far as culinary arts or performing arts, or we do have a really beautiful landscape here that a lot of our artists know the rich history of our um, community here. And basically we do want to tell those stories and moving forward, you know, our limits are only limited by our, our thinking. And so, you know, we're always thinking outside the box. We're always thinking bigger and better. And um, who knows, next year uh, we might be able to offer tours that, you know, people can see art, visit our local area, take part in creating art, tasting some of the traditional foods that we have here. Uh, the limits, you know, are just endless. And, you know, those are some of the things that we want to do as we continue to move forward. So again, I would like to thank you for listening and I would like to thank um, everyone for letting me be part of this uh, webinar here. Thank you. Okay, and um, I'm gonna ask a few questions of the panelists and then uh, thanks to everyone for uh, the questions. Uh, apologies for some of the tech glitches, um, but hopefully, uh, you got the information you needed, and uh, I wanted to start, uh, Anzia. Um, you know, what does you, you guys are developing values-driven uh, food businesses, right? That's sort of how you describe your work. So, what does that look like? It's a really good question, and you know, just like my fellow panelists, we are we are learning a lot by doing. We are figuring it out as we go, but we're starting with clear values and commitments, um, which are aligned with the high road practices that rock and other folks doing work around the country really lift up. Um, as I mentioned before, it means paying a living wage. So um, in our local food shop and cafe and the rest of our nonprofit, our starting salary starting wage is 13 an hour um, with the hopes that we can bump people up within two months um, and then continue to give raises as we can. Um, we provide 100% of vision, dental, and health coverage. Um, we provide a match for retirement benefits, and we provide a lot of um, opportunities for professional growth and development. Our organization is not very big, and so there are not tremendous opportunities to move, move up within the organization. And so we really think about how to do goal setting with employees and support their growth both within and beyond Three Sisters Kitchen. Um, and as we figure out what that looks like for us, both as a nonprofit and as a social enterprise restaurant, we hope to be able to share our model with our food business trainees and with other folks in the sector. Great, thanks. Um, Sandra, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Co-op Catalyst's uh, public policy role. Um, you know, I, I, I'm aware that you guys got funding from the state of uh, New Mexico and, and that's not easy. So, you know, how is, um, you know, 10 years ago would have been unthinkable really for, for a worker co-op developer to be getting state support. And so, you know, talk a little bit about that process. Sure, um, thanks Steve. You know, I think, um, I think we're in a co-op moment in a way because we're all aware that there are immense problems throughout the country, the world, and cooperatives are a piece of the solution. They're not all of it, but they are a piece. And so I think really our critical thing was listening to the issues that people have and then figuring out if and how cooperatives can address those issues. That's just as true for people like the folks at SUNY as it is for the state government. You know, they too are struggling with how to deal with the challenges that we have economically. So it's really just highlighting the solutions and um, and talking to people all over the place. Are there any pointers you would give though to like, I mean, there's a lot of nonprofits on, on the 
on this call who are doing public policy advocacy, anything that, you know, that you did that really worked? We talk to people. You know, that's really, that's really all it is. The, um, if you, as those of you who have listened can hear, if you, um, if you have people like Keith and his board who have done an amazing job of what they have, have done in a ridiculously short period of time, um, if you can highlight people like Keith and his group, um, it's just, you know, it's just inspiring and ins inspiration and solutions, I think, are what we're all looking for. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Keith, do you want to say a little bit about, you know, how the co-op is affecting the, the culture of the Zuni Pueblo community where you live? Yeah, it definitely. Um, so one of the things that I talked about is regaining that sense of community uh, that's been kind of torn apart with not being able to, you know, provide for families. Like I said, one of the things uh, was that, you know, when somebody's dictating, you know, our market and what we should deserve, you know, that creates a lot of grief between people and not wanting to share and help one another like we used to. Like uh, Alvin stated, you know, with the, the farming, we were a farming community and, you know, we were willing to help because, you know, crops, or if somebody had a plentiful crop, you know, they were willing to share. But when everybody's lacking those resources, you know, it was really difficult to want to share because you had to take care of your family first. And so one of the things that we're doing here is, you know, we're trying to change that mentality back that, you know, yes, you know, resources are limited when we're working by ourselves, but as we're working together as a community, as a network, we're able to reach further out and provide more resources to our families, to our community. And that way, if somebody still is struggling, struggling, we are more willing to help that person out versus, you know, just let them struggle. And so those are some of the things that we are trying to change here in our community. Great, thanks. Um, so I'll ask one more question and I'm going to move into the audience questions. There's a lot of really good ones. Um, but I know we were talking a little bit before the call about uh, risk and economic development. And, and, you know, so, you know, the, the conventional story would be, you know, the businesses like you start are too risky, right? So, you know, I wouldn't want to put my philanthropic capital or, or investment dollars there. Um, how should we be thinking about this? Is that directed to me? <laughs> uh, it can be to anybody. I think, I think we're all, you're all dealing, we're all dealing with this in the field, right? So you know, it, it's connected to some of the audience questions too about access to capital. And so there's a conventional definition of risk and then there's, you know, maybe a different way of thinking about risk. Yeah, I, I think for us, you know, that risk is shared um, to where, you know, it's not just one person that's investing all their capital or investing all their time. Uh, one of the things that's pretty neat here is how quickly and how responsive our members are in wanting to help. You know, we've had uh, some issues pop up to where we would have to think we would have to outsource to get some of these jobs done. But, you know, within our own network of people, you know, they had other trades and other skills that they were willing to step up and say, hey, I can do that. We can do that together. And so a lot of it is a lot of this wouldn't be possible without a lot of volunteer from our members. Uh, and so that kind of, well, we still need a little bit of capital, but I think uh, one of the things that helped us was a lot of the fundraisers that we did to initiate um, this business. And a lot of people saw the benefit for our community, um, both within our community and outside. And so those people were really um, gracious enough to, you know, help us out to start off with some sort of capital. And so I think that was really helpful for us. Great. Thanks. Um, Steve, that question really gets at the heart of what our food business training program at Three Sisters Kitchen is designed to do. Um, you know, what we know is that people without much financial capital don't have the luxury of experimentation and exploration and learning from what does and doesn't work. Um, there's tremendous pressure to start a business and have it be successful. And if it doesn't work, then you've failed. And what we're trying to do is, is create a space where people understand um, that it 
can take real time and that they are deserving of that time and space to try things, learn from them, explore, experiment. And, and our goal at Three Sisters is to provide the support so that they don't have to take financial risk of their own until they have determined that their product concept is viable, that they have a clear sense of, of their entrepreneurial path, and that they have a real community. I so appreciate what, what Keith has been saying, the power of doing this work together. Um, so though we're not a cooperative model, we are deeply focused on mutual benefit and building community in a sector that can feel really isolating, right? If, if small food producers are competing against each other for, for markets and are not building on strengths together and, and helping each other, um, then we know their, their products just will not be as successful. And so how do we create space so that they are both enjoying the luxury and benefiting from the, the luxury of, of time and space to try new things and learn from them and also building together and learning together. Great, thanks. Uh, Let me just add, can I just add two seconds onto that, moving from the specific to the general? Uh, I think the risk is in doing what we have been doing. That's where the risk lies. And if we keep doing what we've been doing, then we're all in trouble. So what we are working on now, all of us, is a risk reduction strategy. Great, thanks. Um, Nancy, I think I'll start with a question from the audience for you. Um, so uh, you guys are a 501c3, right? So, um, you know, how do you uh, how do you speak to donors about the training you're doing? And uh, you know, particularly, I think there's somebody who's trying to raise from the question. It sounds like somebody's trying to raise money from foundations themselves. So, any any pointers you can give? Yeah, I mean, what we've found in the, the funding community that is supporting our work now is a real excitement, um, both about supporting those entrepreneurs who lack financial capital but bring so much other capital to the table um, and, and creating space for um, real, viable business development. Um, also, there's tremendous excitement and support for thinking about ways to concretely um, impact the local food economy, right? So one requirement that we have for our food business trainees is that everybody incorporates one local ingredient in their product concept. And we really strive to connect our trainees to local farmers and ranchers. So they're able to think about local sourcing in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming. They're able to think about the true cost of food. Um, that, that has been compel compelling with, with some of our supporters and funders. Um, and similarly, really thinking about how are we building good jobs? jobs with dignity? How are we thinking about the jobs that our communities and our families need and what does it take to get there? And so again, my, my mantra right now is really, you know, we deserve space to explore and experiment. Entrepreneurs deserve that space. Um, and so really asking for partnership from the funding community as we build out models that we think will contribute to healthier economies and healthier communities. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, I think it does. Thanks. Um, Keith, there was a question for you about uh, how do you uh, foster uh, member engagement and, and leadership? You know, it's, it's something that Alvin talked about in, in, in the interview I did with him too, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the cooperative. Um, so you have, you have the role of president, but of course, the cooperative requires many leaders, right? Yes. Yeah. So I am just one of many people here. And I think one of the things, like I said earlier, is, you know, each of the members that we do have here has their own unique uh, skills and talents and traits that uh, they've brought in. And it's not just art. And they, they're carpenters, they're bookkeepers. They have a lot of uh, skills that, you know, is really beneficial to our cooperative here. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that's uh, really helpful. And being from the same community, uh, having the same values, having the same vision and goal, uh, I think it's something that's really been uh, helpful to our um, to starting this up because there are a couple of times that people have tried to start something like this in Zuni but never really got to a point to where um, it's been um, successful to um, stay here for a very long time and so uh, I think we just have a really good group of people here and I think Sandra can vouch for that too that you know when something's was when something's happened everybody's willing really to jump in and you know figure out what it is that we can do to you know remedy the situation or 
uh, as far as if it's brainstorming different ideas of how to do different things, you know, they're all they're always there. And basically, some of them, some of the people said, we basically live here at our gallery, and I think that's one of the reasons why it kind of helps us. Great, thanks. Um, um, Sandra, I was gonna. So this is a question. That, I mean, anybody could answer this one, but um, it, you talked about. New Mexico as a state and a little bit of its history, right? Um, and so, you know, there was a question asked, you know, that unfortunately New Mexico often, as I'm sure you're aware, ends up in the, we'll put in the 40s anyway, on, on some of the charts uh, when comparing the 50 states, right? And, um, you know, why is that? And what are some important steps that could change that? Why, why, why is that would be, uh, that would be the subject of another webinar. So, uh, so let's not go there unless, okay. unless everybody's got hours. But I think it is precisely that, um, that feeling that sometimes we see ourselves as second class or 40th class or thank goodness for Mississippi, or because Mississippi is all often lower on statistics than New Mexico is, but it is precisely that which makes cooperatives a strong contender for ways to foster community and economic development. And that's really, that's really what we heard when we started talking about cooperatives and about whether there might or might not be a role for a cooperative catalyst is that there is a lot we don't have, but what we do have as a state is, is an internal ability for resilience and an ability to lead that is not often demonstrated outside of our communities. And and that's really where we're focusing. That's why we think cooperatives are, are a good fit. Great, thanks. Um, so this is a question I think that could go to any of you, and so feel free to jump in. Um, but the question is really about the ecosystem. And how, do, how do groups collaborate, you know, whether they're in the food space or the art space or the cultural economy uh, uh, space, you know, especially across sort of the urban uh, rural divides that you know are seen in this in this call right so you know how 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 does this come together would you like to target somebody to start Steve? Uh, whoever wants to jump in don't be shy i can jump in um okay. and just say you know we so three sisters we we opened our local food shop and cafe a month ago our community food space has been open for a year and there were two years prior to that where we were deeply engaged in a, a planning process and we only exist because of our partnerships. Um, both, you know, that's how we were able to fund programming initially, it's how we're able to build out programs with the reach that we have. Um, and I think part of the, the sort of scarcity mentality that we are trying to shift from, right, we, we try to celebrate and focus on um, the tremendous resources that exist in our communities, but the reality is there are limited funds and the way those funds are allocated don't always necessarily reflect our values as, as a small nonprofit organization doing community-based work. And so um, we really believe in the power of bringing people together and, and thinking collectively and thinking about mutual benefit. Um, and so each of our programs really is, is a celebration of partnership. I realize that's a very general answer, but it's, it's sort of born out of necessity um, and it's what makes our, our work so much more impactful and I think so much more sustainable, right? Three Sisters is not held by me or by our staff, right? Our mission is shared and broad and will continue because of those partnerships. Great, great, thanks. Uh, Keith, do you want to jump in? Do the rural side with you all? <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, so going along with that, you know, it does require a lot of partnerships. Uh, we have also been blessed to have um, tremendous partnerships within our community who see the same visions and to see the same goals as we do. 
And to be a part of that, you know, those are some of the things that's been really beneficial to starting something like this. Um, yeah, it's, there's always limitations. And I think um, some of the things that kind of helps is that there's a, a really strong uh, interest in Zuni. And so we're kind of fortunate to be part of that community that a lot of people are interested in learning about, uh, dating back all the way to the early 1900s, you know, different philanthropists coming in and, you know, just listening and studying Zuni. And so I think we've been fortunate enough to have an audience big enough that really are interested in Zuni and, you know, what comes from Zuni. And so one of the biggest things is the art from Zuni. And so that has been a really big um, bonus for us <laughs> that there are a lot of people interested in about who we are and where we're coming from. And so I think those are some of the things that's been uh, really helpful. Great. Um, Sandra, do you, you get to do both rural and urban in your job. So how do you think about this and the coalition building? You know, it just has to be. I, I think that goes back to, um, you know, the scarcity mentality that everybody has uh, has mentioned or referred to in a variety of different ways. And, and resources are scarce. And those are not only funding resources, but they're people resources. And it is critical that we all work together. It is crazy to operate in a silo. And it, and that that's true everywhere. I mean, we could not go into the communities that we go into if we didn't have partners there. Um, and we wouldn't know what we were doing. So we have to work with with partners. And I just just one quick story because I think stories are important here too. Is a month or so ago we had folks from arts as well as from the DNA Regenerative Agricultural Co-op come to Albuquerque. And Keith can speak to this in more detail, but I, it was really wonderful to see how two totally different cooperatives, both on tribal lands, um, kind of uh, learned from each other and fed off of each other's enthusiasm and um, really supported each other in ways both specific and kind of emotional. And it's that type of energy that we need to build on in a community where sometimes there's a whole lot of negative energy. Great. Uh, so I'm going to give you another question just came in, but it was sort of uh, if somebody wanted to um, start a co-op and when, you know, if they were in New Mexico and they wanted to work with Co-op Catalyst, how would they, beyond just sort of the, oh, well, you go to their website, but, you know, how do you actually, you know, take in new, new projects? How do we actually take and have people come to us? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, don't go to our website. That's the first thing, um, <laughs> because um, we're kind of the shoemaker's children. We haven't quite gotten that done yet. Uh, but um, feel free to contact us. You can go to our Facebook page as well. Um, and we have kind of a process that we go through where we tend to work with folks who have an idea and have a dream. There are other there are other ways of forming cooperatives, but um, but as you can hear from from Keith's passion, we really see our roles as 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 the catalyst. So we we really rely on people who come to us to say, I really 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 want to do this, and my five friends do too. And um, so you could reach me at uh, Sandra at coopcatalystnm.org. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank um, so this is a question for Anzia, I think. Um, maybe a little bit of field, but you guys work with food businesses, and there was a question about uh, climate change impact on farmers. So you're not directly affected, but you're certainly indirectly affected. So, you know, what does that look like in, in New Mexico? Um, it's an incredibly serious issue, I think, as it is internationally. Um, and so we really 
in focusing on, on local food, local sourcing, local ingredients, right? Our work there is really coming from conversations with growers, thinking about the realities of, of small farming, specifically here in New Mexico. Um, I am definitely, I'm not a farmer and I'm not an expert on local agriculture, but um, you know, we're seeing really unpredictable um, weather patterns. We're seeing a lot of different types of, of pest trends and those obviously are impacting crop production. Um, what we've been really focusing on is letting farmers drive the conversation with our food producers. So in our food business training program, you know, initially I'll, I'll say the program was established in response to the request from growers who were either having challenges um, meeting production goals or were having food waste issues in the field. They were growing food that, that they weren't selling at markets. They were looking for more consistent revenue strategies um, and they were interested in value added or manufactured food production as a way to use the food they were growing to ensure you know, revenue year round. And so those conversations are what planted the seed for our training program and, and local ingredients and the needs of farmers have continued to, to drive our, you know, our, our values and, and our work with that, that program. And so we introduce trainees to local growers. We have a panel, we do farm visits. Um, as I said, we require the inclusion of one local ingredient, but all of that is to the end of thinking about what small farmers need in the context of, of very real changing climate and, and what that means for the challenges in the field. So, um, you know, we look to, to the farmers to tell us what those realities are and, and what strategies might make sense going forward. Great, thanks. Um, Keith, a, a question for you. I don't know if, you know, if this is quite in your area of expertise, but I'm going to try. Uh, so the question was really about um, in the Pueblo communities like SUNY Pueblo, uh, you know, what is, what is the situation in terms of things like, like health coverage? Um, yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh... I guess I can share what I do know. We do have a local IHS, you know, which was part of some of the treaties, you know, that were signed that we do have a, a Indian Health Hospital here. Um, so there are those coverages that we do have. Um, we still, um, recently, uh, a lot of the community members have been, been able to acquire a lot of the Medicare um, programs that we have in New Mexico. So, uh, you know, those are some of the things that are, you know, are available here in our community, uh, as well as other Pueblo communities as well. So, as, as, as <laughs> Is that something you're looking at? You know, you started the co-op, so are you, but are you looking at the co-op as potentially becoming a way of getting better health coverage, as among other things? Uh, yeah, I, those are some of the things um, that we, you know, we're looking for as far as growing, you know, it will be better health coverage and also uh, um, some type of retirement funds too, because a lot of the things that we saw with our artists here is they basically work until their last breath. <laughs> uh, a lot of times, you know, they don't uh, have the the planning of, you know, saving up something for retirement. So a lot of the communities you know, elderly, uh, sick, they continue to work because uh, if they don't work, they don't make any money. And so that's basically the mentality of the community. And so, you know, those are some of the things that we're looking at as far as providing within a cooperative, hopefully in the near future is, you know, provide some kind of uh, financial assistance once, you know, once they feel like, okay, I'm done working for now. Uh, I have this that I can rely on for however long. Um, but yeah, all of that will also probably go with uh, some type of health coverage. Uh, but a lot of the things that you know, we do have, dental, vision, uh, a lot of those are kind of covered with the local IHS hospitals here. Okay, thanks. Um, Sandra, a question for you uh, about conversions. Uh, so to, is that part of the work of Co-op Catalyst to convert existing businesses that might be uh, you know, standard privately owned, maybe a family business owner is retiring. Um, has Co-op Catalyst thought about doing some of that type of work as well as startup? Absolutely. Um, it, it's a big problem. You know, there's something like 
well, I don't, I don't won't remember the statistics, but a whole lot of folks who are retiring who don't know what to do with their business afterwards. And we have not yet ourselves done any conversions and um, although we are looking at some, so we have developed partnerships with other cooperative developers who, who have done conversions so that should somebody come to us and say, this is what I want to do, we're, we're able to work with them. It's, it's key and, you know, it really solves a challenge that we have um, in New Mexico where frequently somebody wants to retire, they can't find a buyer, so they sell their business to um, somebody from out of state, the person from out of state buys it and says, oh yes, we promise we're going to keep those jobs in New Mexico. And within a couple of years, they've moved to Chicago or California or wherever, and, um, and we lose those jobs forever. It's, it's really critical that we work on that. Great. Thanks. Um, so there was, we've got a couple questions on capital and financing and one person you know, is involved with, you know, a campaign you may be familiar with in New, New Mexico to establish a, a public bank. Um, you know, it, are there specific solutions you see that would help provide, um, you know, more capital for the, the kind of startups we're talking about here? I can, I can chime yeah, in here. Um, one sort of pilot that we've been um, experimenting with at Three Sisters Kitchen is the result of a partnership with a, a local credit union, Nusenda Credit Union, um, who said that they wanted to figure out how to get capital to entrepreneurs that were not tradi considered traditional borrowers, right? It gets to that question of risk and who's who's a good risk and, and who's not deemed a, a good risk. And, um, and so they have been supporting cohorts of organizations, community-based organizations, to help figure out how to get capital to in the hands of folks that need it. So we are thrilled to be a partner. That program is called, co um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> co <-op> capital. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. Um, co capital program. And we are able to say for folks who go through our food business training program, who get to know over a 90-hour hands-on training over 15 weeks, um, who are ready to take the leap to launch their own manufactured food business, that we believe in them and our relationship serves as collateral. Um, their credit history doesn't matter. And we are then able to provide consistent support, you know, financial education, but also check-ins and, and the community that we're so invested in to make sure people um, are, are repaying um, and are really thinking about their businesses in, in ways that make sense. Those loans are capped at 5%. We, as the nonprofit partner, raise a portion, but they're primarily backed by Nusenda and their funding partners. And what we're thrilled about is that we have the benefit of having a local food shop so our borrowers can pay us back in product and we can then make loan payments on their behalf as we're selling their product in our cafe. So that's one example in New Mexico specifically that, that we're really excited about. We're in the early stages, but we've been really grateful for that partnership and the willingness on behalf of Nusenda Credit Union to take a risk on borrowers that, that other banks may not be willing to. Great. Um, so Keith, I think I'm going to give you the last question. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a question about what incentives are created as a cooperative to encourage artists to work together. Um, you know, I know it's early days, but maybe say a little bit about, you know, sort of what it means when you're competing uh, on your own, you know, with, against the imitation jewelry, as opposed to having a cooperative where you can control the market. Yeah, and I think that's basically it. You know, uh, when you're working by yourself, you know, you really don't understand the market. And it just, like I said, the wealth of knowledge that we do have with the artists here, um, we're changing the way, you know, that we're teaching one another because a lot of us artists, you know, we're kind of like um, Sandra brought up, we're working in a silo. We kind of figure out things on our own by try and error. And a lot of times we fail a lot of times before we succeed. And having people here who've been through those struggles, you know, teaching these younger artists, you know, this is what I encountered growing up. This is what I encountered when I first started. You know, you should try this instead so you don't make the same mistakes I did. Uh, I was 
you know, those are at least one of the benefits that, you know, from the many that we have as far as, you know, knowledge sharing with one another, you know, sharing with each other, you know, what's useful, what's not, you know, you know, how can we, uh, I, I guess, how, how can we attack this problem that we have in front of us? Uh, and so, you know, just having, you know, that sharing and cross training with one another is very beneficial as far as being a in part of a co-op because you know when you're by yourself you're figuring it out on your own a lot of times that's how a lot of um, artists you know look at different or basically what they say they have to get a real job <laughs> because mm -hmm. uh, they, they run out of funds um, because you know some products might fail and they're not able to take care of their families and so having those people here who've been through those struggles to share with you know artists of all ages, because, you know, um, everybody still goes through those struggles, but to have somebody there to kind of mentor you along as you're trying different things out to, you know, show you the things that they went through and what helped them is definitely something that's really useful. It's been really useful to me uh, because there are certain things that I still did not understand when we joined the cooperative, you know, there's artists that were willing to tell us, hey, you know what, if you do it this way, you know, you have much better results versus trying to do it the way you're doing it right now. And so that's one of the benefits of, you know, having artists work together as far as, you know, being a part of a cooperative. Great. Um, well, I think we do need to wrap it up. <laughs> but, uh, so let me go. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I want to thank, uh, you know, Keith Adaki, uh, Sandra Picardo, and Anzia Bennett for, for all the amazing contributions uh, you make both in your work and, and here today uh, on our webinar for, for Nonprofit Quarterly. Um, I uh, will reiterate, uh, so thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for all the great questions you had. I, I hope we got to at least many of them. And, uh, you know, we, I do want to make a, a, a quick ask, you know, that, you know, we do rely on, we are a nonprofit ourselves, hence our name. Um, and if you enjoy this webinar, please do consider donating today. Uh, we do have a matching gift, um, so your donation will be doubled by that match. Um, thanks so much. And uh, just to start your calendars, our next uh, webinar is going to be focused on uh, Indian country more broadly. We'll have another uh, person from uh, the Zuni Pueblo community, as it turns out, as well as uh, uh, Ojibwe and uh, Lakota up in the uh, upper Midwest. So uh, look forward to that. That's going to be on November 21st. Each of our webinars is on the third Thursday of the month at 2 p.m. Eastern, if you can remember that. But um, thanks again, and thanks again so much to our panelists. Thank you very much, everyone.